This is Gravity and Grace, Chapter 7, To Desire Without an Object. Purification is the separation of good from covetousness. We have to go down to the root of our desires in order to tear the energy from its object. That is where the desires are true insofar as they are energy. It is the object which is unreal. But there is an unspeakable wrench in the soul at the separation of a desire from its object. If we go down into ourselves, we find that we possess exactly what we desire. If we long for a certain being who is dead, we desire a particular limited being, therefore necessarily a mortal, and we long for that special being who, to whom, etc. In short, that being who died at such and such a time, on such and such a day, and we have that being, dead, to ascertain exactly what the miser lost whose treasure was stolen. Thus we should learn much. Lawson and the office of captain of musketeers, he preferred to be a prisoner and a captain of musketeers rather than go free and not be captain. These are garments. They were ashamed of their nakedness. To lose someone we suffer because the departed, the absent, has become imaginary and unreal. But our desire for him is not imaginary. We have to go down into ourselves to the abode of the desire which is not imaginary. Hunger. We imagine kinds of food, but the hunger itself is real. We have to fasten onto the hunger. The presence of the dead person is imaginary, but his absence is very real. Henceforward, it is his way of appearing. We must not seek the void, for it would be tempting God if we counted on supernatural bread to fill it. We must not run away from it either. The void is the supreme fullness, but man is not permitted to know it. The proof is that Christ himself was at one moment completely unaware of it. One part of the self should know it, but not the other parts, for if they knew it in their base fashion, they would no longer be any void. Christ experienced all human misery except sin, but he experienced everything which makes man capable of sin. It is the void which makes man capable of sin. All sins are attempts to fill voids. Thus my life, with all its stains, is near to his perfectly pure one, and the same is true of much lower lives. However low I fall, I shall not go very far from him, but if I fall, I shall no longer be able to know this. The handshake of a friend on a meeting again after a long absence. I do not even notice whether it gives pleasure or pain to my sense of touch. Like the blind man who feels the objects directly at the end of his stick, I feel the presence of my friend directly. It is the same with life circumstances, wherever they may be, and God. This implies that we should never seek consolation for pain, because felicity is beyond the realm of consolation and pain. We become aware of it through a sense which is different, just as the perception of objects at the end of a stick or an instrument is different from touch in the strict sense of the word. This other sense is formed by a shifting of the attention through an apprenticeship in which the whole soul and body participate. This is why we read in the gospel, I say to you that these have received their reward. There must be no compensation. It is the void in our sensibility which carries us beyond sensibility. Denial of St. Peter. To say to Christ, I will never deny thee, was to deny him already, for it was supposing the source of faithfulness to be in himself and not in grace. Happily, he was chosen. This denial was made manifest to all and to himself. How many others boast in the same way, and they never understand. It was difficult to be faithful to Christ. It was fidelity in the void. It was much easier to be faithful to Napoleon, even if it involved death. It was easier for the martyrs to be faithful later on because the church was already there, a force with temporal promises. We die for what is strong, not for what is weak, or only for what is weak momentarily, and has still kept an aureole of strength. Faithfulness to Napoleon at St. Helena was not faithfulness in the void. The fact of dying for what is strong robs death of bitterness, and at the same time of all its value. To implore a man is a desperate attempt through sheer intensity to make our systems of values pass into him. To implore God is just the contrary. It is an attempt to make the divine values pass into ourselves, far from thinking, with all the intensity of which we are capable, of the values to which we are attached. We must preserve an interior void. End of chapter 7